In your introduction, you mentioned Peter Carey's book. Could you talk about what it was that resonated with you in the source material, and specifically what you wanted to portray in that Kelly as? Well, I, I just, that, that notion, that idea of someone's history being stolen from them, and, and the, the idea of having to kind of write down your own history, otherwise it starts to be owned by someone else, and it's definitely a kind of thing that's happened to, to Ned. He's become a kind of mythical figure in Australia, and he means something to all sorts of people in regards to um, identity in that country, in, in, in Australia. So there was um, there, there was something in, in, intriguing about looking at a figure like that and trying to work out why we try to find so meaning in a 25-year-old that was, you know, a bush ranger. Uh, and I guess just sort of poking and prodding around as to kind of, um, you know, what that is. For such a mythic figure, what really struck me about the film is how rooted it is in a gritty reality. The, the physicality of it, whether it's the setting or uh, the domestic space and his upbringing, the violence. Can you talk about why those were important elements for you? Um, well, I think anyone who comes to Australia, and especially in those parts of Australia, the landscape is pretty intimidating. You, you really feel like you, you, you're a um, stranger on it. And, uh, uh, I think the character's relationship with that landscape uh, was very, uh, very important. Um, especially some of the the, the, the English characters, some of the, the antagonists in the um, in the uh, film. Uh, I, I was sort of fascinated by them looking just as kind of dismantled and lost in the landscape as Ned and the family. Um, and, and that's something I think as a country we wrestle with is this kind of incredible history that goes far, far, far back before colonisation. So the, the landscape is ancient there. It is one of the you know, oldest landscapes um, in the world. And it, 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 it was, there, was a, there was something a little cursed about these particular areas that we kind of shot that sort of sped into the kind of psychology of Ned and the idea that he couldn't outrun a destiny, a fate of being a Kelly, um, that it's almost like the whole landscape was driving him towards that kind of end, you know, in the, in, in the prison. Could you talk about staging that final shootout sequence? It's remarkable, <coughs> first of all, but so punishing, brutal, and highly stylized. Can you talk about the, the direction you took? Um, well, it's a fever dream. It, it, it really is sort of uh, the idea that the film starts off wide and actually kind of contracts down to the kind of slit of the helmet and the very, very impressionistic point of view of uh, a man sort of heading towards this kind of tank, this lizard, this kind of monitor, uh, as he talks about. So it was about bringing the audience right into that visceral perspective of Ned and uh, staying contained within Glen Rowan and really experiencing, I think, the kind of intensity and the sense of trappedness of what it would have been like for the three boys. Um, and that kind of, I guess, countering with the um, you know, the notion of him transforming into a kind of, um, you know, something kind of very, very strange and violent. A big part of portraying Ned Kelly in a film is casting the part. Could you talk about George McKay? Yeah, well, he did a, a, an amazing uh, audition. Mm -hmm. It was quite, quite incredible, but I was also aware that, he, I mean, George is just the loveliest man I've ever met. He's incredibly giving, he's polite, he's um, genuinely, uh, you you want the best for George McKay. And I, I wanted Ned to come on screen and for the audience to want the best for Ned. And then you sort of felt as though he had possibilities in it. You felt as though maybe he could be a writer, maybe he could be a prime minister. Who knows in those times, you know? So the idea that, that you were taking someone like that and then pushing them and shifting and changing them into kind of what he becomes at the end felt, felt much more interesting than, I guess, signposting it at the beginning with you know, a, a, an actor or a kind of, um, or, or a kind of an approach to Ned that uh, you felt like they would end up like that, you know, just as you sort of saw them. If there are any questions in the audience, please raise your hand, I already see one. Questions about the creative process, collaborating with a new cinematographer. Yeah, um, well, Adam Arkapoor, who kind of shot my last films, and Ari Benger, who shot this, both came out of film school exactly the same time as me. Um, and uh, I was really excited about um, continuing the relationship that I had with Ari from film school those years back, but 
also with a story like this, um, you know, uh, having someone that, I mean, Ari's so quiet on set, she's so sensitive and she, but she's so focused as to what she wants. Um, so it was the work that Atisha done, Lady Macbeth, this really beautiful film. Um, and there's a sort of sensitivity in that that I thought could be really important with, you know, quite a kind of brutal kind of, um, you know, masculine heavy film. Um, so, yeah, we, we, she's, she, she's amazing. She's um, doing Jay Campion's next film now, and uh, she's, uh, she's someone I'm you know, desperate to kind of work with again. More questions? Questions about finding the balance between portraying the different stages of his life, from his you know, childhood to his adolescence and adulthood. Yeah, it was it was pretty close to, to, to it's a it's a really really thick book. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges is how do you kind of uh, you know dissect it down to to a point of view and a kind of focus. It was always going to be that beginning uh, uh, the kind of little Ned. Ellen, Harry Power kind of story. But the second half, we wanted to take you in very quickly to, I guess, the sense of Ned returning to his mother, the hold that she kind of had on him, but also Glenn Rowan at the end, uh, which, which doesn't figure very much within the book, the, the, the shootout. Um, there are so many different reasons as to why Ned uh, was held up in Glen Rowan and actually sort of invited the police there. And we made a decision pretty quickly that it was it was about an idea to get his mother out. It was this crazy, crazy idea of, well, what if I was able to get the whole Victorian police force to me, derail this train, kill them all, put down our suits of armour and go into Melbourne City and get my mum out of jail. It, it had a kind of fever dream about it that was kind of so unrealistic. And I guess there was that line that Ellen says, like, you know how much your child loves you by the links they'll go to you know, protect you, to kind of save you. Um, so once we found that kind of climax, and that's what that climax meant, it, it was really about kind of getting through really quite quickly to that kind of transformation of him from Nick Kelly the man into kind of the monitor. More questions? In the back, it's about the prevalence of the maternal figure in the film and the psychology behind the, the character of the mother. Uh, well, it was, it's definitely a love story <laughs> between a mother and a son. I mean, it's a, it, 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 that screamed off the page of Peter Carey's book. Um, and, you know, she's a, she's a survivor in the whole film. I mean, she's the last one standing. All the men have kind of fallen over and kind of dismantled. So there's something about Ellen, which is, it's about survival, teaching her children to survive. I think she's desperately scared that Ned's gonna leave her that he's going to outgrow her, that it could be something better than her. So there's a kind of, you know, uh, a thing inside her which is about keeping him back, about owning him. Um, and even at the end, you know, she looks at Ned and, you know, she says, even in death, don't let the bastards see that you're scared, you know, die like a good Kelly. Um, it's, it's brutal, but it, there, there's this kind of dignity to her that, that and, and this kind of loyalty to the name that uh, she feels as though Ned should be. At the same time, I think she grieves uh, what he's been made to do and what he's been made to become. Um, and he just is devoted to her, you know, out of all the characters, she's the strongest presence in his life, the strongest, um, the one that gives him the most strength, um, but at the same time, the one that kind of leads him down, down, down this path. I think I saw another hand somewhere. Are you sure changing in the film? Yeah, talk about that. You're, you're the first one that's uh, noticed that so far, so that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, it's deliberately coming down as the film, we wanted the film to be a wider outlook at the beginning and as the point of view came down to the slit of the helmet, which it literally does at the end, the aspect ratio comes down as well to kind of make you feel more and more crammed and claustrophobic into his point of view. We have time for just one last question. What's your next project, and how does this gentleman audition for it? Um, obviously, I'm doing an Australian book called uh, Shantaram, uh, which is uh, which is going to be made into a TV series. Uh, so I'm actually going to be shooting in India uh, towards the end of the year. I've, I've, I've never done a TV series before, so I'm super excited about about working on that. Take note for all those who wish to audition. I'm sure everyone here does. 
I'm gonna steal one last question before we go, because I think music and the soundscape of this film is so important to shaping its mood. Could you talk about that? Uh, yeah, like, I had biggest influence were birds. I don't know if you can kind of hear them all the way through. The, the, they, they were real birds within the landscape. And Australian birds are the loudest, raucous, cheekiest, like, screamers. You, you could, which I think is, I've got a theory, I think it's why Australian rock music like ACDC and so forth is so loud and crazy is, is, is because of these birds. So the, the cockatoos there are um, so intimidating in their, in their kind of sonic sound. So Jed, um, my brother, who was the composer, um, just spent time on set listening to the birds and uh, the idea that the music was kind of in a percussive way coming out of the the, uh, the landscape that a felzo could be played with it on the set and the birds could kind of accompany it. Um, but it was a really interesting thing that the, we, we pushed the birds more and more throughout the throughout the world and um, there, there is something interesting in, in Australia that when you are in a dangerous situation or place in that landscape, it's always, you always hear the beautiful call of a live bird or a small call of a parrot, or and then that's going to be burst with a cockatoo. It's it's this kind of absolute mix up of sounds and sights and feelings. Um, so that was the, the, the landscape was our first point of call with 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 how we approached the film site. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have, Justin. Thank you Thanks so much. much.